Madness is an extreme form of suffering. It, for the most part, refers to schizophrenia, which is a distressing and, I think, extremely bewildering, terrifying condition expressed in a whole range of ways, particularly delusions, hallucinations, various forms of thought disorder, and I suppose most dramatically, hearing voices, often commanding voices. I've worked in this field for about 25 years, listened to these extraordinary accounts of young people traumatized by their psychotic experiences, and I felt the need to, in a way, pay tribute to these patients. So I sat down to write a libretto in an attempt to enter into the world of psychosis, to try in an as authentic and respectful way as possible to communicate the turmoil and the distress of, of these patients in these psychotic states. And for that reason, it seemed to me very important that if I was going to do this in a truthful way, that I use the utterances of the patients themselves, that I used first person accounts to communicate the vividness of these experiences. So I try to imagine really what it must be like being within a psychotic world. I really wanted to do the drawings for the libretto, I think as the first person to read it. And um, the way that he'd written it it appealed to me because I thought it was very beautiful and strange, and I understood it. I've been listening to the stories told by Sean's patients for maybe 30 years. Sean never told me their names. He was always very discreet like that. But I've had these stories in my head for a long time. And when I started to do the artwork, the images came to me incredibly easily. One of the patients talks about a snake inside him, a world snake that's inside him. And I started with that picture. It was sort of inspired by the incredible detail that some patients go into when they're making art. It's a depiction of fantasy worlds and often they seem to want to fill up every space so I worked at it and I included images that were from the whole libretto and it became more and more intricate. I finished the picture and I left it somewhere where Sean could see it and he picked it up and he said, oh yes, I like that and that encouraged me and I just started doing other images from the libretto without him really specifically asking me. Pictures of how I responded to the words of the libretto, the words, in fact, of his patients. Over and over again, his patients talked about really strange images. Snakes, armies of birds, that are a kind of a gift to an artist.
When Sean first approached me about madness, I was obviously thrilled and also daunted um, by the enormity of the, the task, the complexity of the subject matter, how to speak to the South African context, um, how to portray such serious subject matter with sensitivity and authenticity. Sean described his vision of the project as intense, austere, not a gaudy performance of madness, not a how madness is perceived from the outside, but he wanted to get really into the internal state. Uh, he wanted it to be more subtle. Um, he didn't want it to be acted like a play. He wanted the characters to be still and that we really focus in on the material and the music and the words and the visuals are really what lead the emotional narrative. We asked Galina to try and reflect these at times bewildering shifts in an art of psychotic state. Sean's brief wasn't specific about the genre of music. There was quite a lot of freedom to explore extremely different emotional states with extremely different genres. I was approached by Baxter and once I got to hear about the story it was very really interesting because not only was it an opportunity to do something new musically for me but I think it spoke to my personal goal as a, as a creative, as a musician that you know whatever we do that there's a reason for it and there's a you know there's a, there's a deeper reason instead of just you know making music is nice but with this show it was interesting because there was so much meaning behind it. Dr. Bowman was at the helm of this whole thing with his expertise, but at the same time, it was all very real in the sense of uh, the words that were used were exact words from, from the patient. Galina mentioned that at times it was not always easy to compose for the exact words, but there was something so real about that. And so it is highly educational, but at the same time, there's a very real component and there's a very relatable component. And so I think because of that, anyone can go and watch. Educated, uneducated, um, in the know, not in the know, scientists, non-scientists, you know, for, for everyone. There's, there's something for everyone with a deeper message. I think Kalina has been enormously successful in a dense variety of themes that reflect the complexity of these extreme mental states. There is a very wide range of expressions of these states. But a fairly characteristic trajectory may be that at the beginning there's a, a maze of confusion a sense of apprehension of things not making sense. I think too much, I think too I much. Can't help myself. Developing very often into extreme states of fear, of terror, of feeling that one is under attack. <laughs> This terror is very real to the patient and possibly as a compensation for that, a defiance. I do not need your help. Something has gone wrong. Something has gone terrible. There's nothing wrong with me. There might be something wrong with the world. And 
grandiosity. carefully about using the term madness and discuss this with my patients. To me it was important to take it out of the very restricted world of medicine and to broaden it, to open it, so that it's open to different ways of thinking which hopefully are potentially creative and more helpful than confining it to um, a sickness, to a form of pathology. done a few pictures, we got Cooker involved and Cooker was the magic person who managed to somehow make these images into something more, more than they were by themselves. The images could be made to shift and change and go smaller and bigger and in and out of themselves and layers and when we saw how it would work it was an absolutely inspiring moment and from then on it was it was just very exciting. storyboard without music at this stage so it was it was completely silent but we could get this feeling of the direction in which it was going to go images specifically for me really helped with my interpretation of the music because the image somehow shocks you when one of the patients feel like they're having a baby but it's a shoe and you kind of hear it and you see you, you see the words and so on but somehow the image it makes you click to just realize but wow that's so far from reality you know to to to, to have a shoe baby the images make it very impactful. And I think also it, it kept the audience engaged. The narrative very simply involves a young man, Temba, who grows up in the rural areas of the Eastern Cape. He's an extremely bright young man. He wins a bursary to study uh, architecture at the university, and he brings with him the hopes and expectations of his community. He excels initially, and then for a number of reasons, a number of stresses, he becomes overwhelmed and he breaks down. Tender the patient 
begins to show all the features of schizophrenia and is admitted to the hospital where I work. His devoted mother is devastated by this descent into madness. And also his lover who cannot make sense of these terrifying behaviours that he demonstrates. We were waiting for the music, so meantime we went through this process of creating entire imaginary silent movies. So that's the patient thing. Yeah, what do you think, Sean? Visual maps of how the images would move and flow together with the lines of text. Then later I readjusted our existing storyboards to the music. And I created a three-dimensional model on the computer using AutoCAD and then a series of corridors. Since Timba was an architect, I was asked to build a cardboard model based on Fiona's drawing of a simple house, and this model was used in various contexts. It was obviously quite an interesting process working far away from South Africa because I was in constant communication the whole time but living a very different reality. And that reality in itself was quite interesting because I was estranged from home and from everything that I knew and loved. So it was quite a private and a, a lonely time in a sense which really helped me to access a lot of my own internal world, that the, the place I needed to go in terms of how to write that music. I had seen examples of art by mentally ill patients. Mostly a catalogue from the Prince Horn collection made by a doctor in the 1920s. And they are extraordinary and they did inspire me quite a lot. We did use a few artworks that had been produced by art patients of Falkenberg, but not many. He 
it should be orange because of this light that I've got in my hand. Yeah, that looks right. We don't need... Okay, I'll bend it then. Cooker's job enormously involved saying we need images for this part and this part and this part and how are we going to link this with this? We'll need an image here, what are we going to use? It was an immense amount of work. Also, the nurses who form a chorus in trying to console and contain the situation. So Tim is admitted to hospital and he comes into contact with other patients, many of whom share similar experiences, who tell their own stories that are used to try and demonstrate both the, the richness and the complexity and the uniqueness of these experiences. Schizophrenia is a disorder of self-consciousness. The inner world becomes engulfed by the external world. There's a loss of the barrier that my mind, my thoughts, my actions are being controlled by external forces. I've lost any sense of autonomy or privacy. Very often patients describe being controlled by a snake, an external force, or that a snake is within them and controlling their, their thoughts and feelings and actions. Given this incredible sense of loss of control, in order just to survive, to cope, you create for yourself extraordinary messianic power. In our unit, there often are patients who believe fervently, who are convinced that they are doctors and healers and priests and saviors. People wanting to make the world a better place. And I think that arises out of a sense of extreme vulnerability. I feel I am in the way. There is no One way to describe these states is to use noise as a metaphor. The patient experiences the intolerable noise. There's no pattern, there's no coherence. I had the huge privilege of being able to work with Dizu Plakis, who's a phenomenal performer and composer. Um, his music was such an incredible portal for my own emotional journey. I would He provided me with these audio tracks that I would sit and listen to and I'd really draw from them in terms of new inspiration and new ways of, of thinking about these 
horrifying and beautiful feelings. Kalina did amazing job because also it's not easy when somebody never played African music combine the classical and the African music together. And that's what I called a world music. One track in particular really touched me. It was performed on Vendor Pipes and this formed the basis for The Lover's Lament. There was such a vulnerability and a tenderness and a melancholy in this particular song that um, it gave me such a clear feeling of, of The Lover. When I first heard the track, it, it became very easy to compose around it and incorporate it into the vision of, of what this lover felt. The project started at Huntley. Sean wrote it here, and something about the wind and the waves entered into the spirit of the libretto. different media, film of waves and sky and clouds and ridges in pools. It reminded Sean of the gyre of the brain. Also, a model was built, tied in with the main character being an architect. And from the model, John created the animation. The patient goes inside the maze of a house, lots of doors and passages and windows, which was extraordinary and, and very effective. We decided to actually handwrite the libretto. I used a mapping pen and Indian ink, which necessitated constant dipping in and splashing. And somehow I think that gave a certain quality to the actual written text that might not have been there otherwise. The written text is definitely a huge part of the feel of the visual aspect of the whole thing. When I was writing The Patient's Madness, I used a stick or a porcupine quill. Sometimes I wrote with my left hand. that I'd done before, this was obviously a lot more technically complicated. We had the words, the images, the sounds, the singers, the microphones, the instruments. We were sending videos and, and snippets of audio back and forth. There was integrating Deezu's music into the whole process, doing edits and then changing the picture. And this was all happening between Zurich and South Africa. The conductor had a click and there were monitors with bits of sound design and crashing and cacophonies of sound and then silence. And the, the huge challenge was for everyone to stay completely in sync with this throughout the whole 70 minutes of, of performance. The public didn't know what to expect. You go into a show because of you see madness and you don't know what kind of madness, where is it going to come? But the way it was portrayed, it was portrayed beautifully. Brilliant artist, Galina. Brilliant show. It's a show that's supposed to travel because madness is everywhere. This is more kind of the... Yeah, it's to find a good phrasing. Mm. This in this, uh, but a bit like mm. this in this, uh, like you slightly behind the beat, yeah. I was writing a play about bipolar and codependency, and I wanted to do some research, and somehow met Sean. I can't even remember how, 
but I contacted him and asked him if I could uh, come and ask him some questions. And he was exceptionally generous with his time. And um, I visited him at Falkenberg a couple of times and he lent me books and um, was enormously helpful in my process in, in writing the play. And then at the exact same time, he was doing this cantata and he expressed um, an interest for me to help him. I mean, primarily, practically at first, because I run the Baxter Theatre and they needed help to put the show on. Um, but then it became evident that they also needed a director, someone to stage the show. So we took that on as Baxter and I took that on as director or Really what I did was staged it. I mean, it didn't need it need much direction because a lot of the drama was uh, in the film and, of course, in the, in the music. So I had to think of a way to stage that effectively, um, which was quite challenging because you didn't want to detract or distract from what was being said, and yet it had to hold an audience theatrically for an hour and a bit. So really you wanted to contain it, both the film, the images, and the music, and the content in the simplest way possible. So with some experimentation with lighting and projection, we came to the decision to put the choir on a steep set of steps and to have them behind a gauze, a white gauze, with front projection, um, as if they were floating in the image, and then to light the actual choir from the back or from behind the gauze. And so they would appear like dreams or hallucinations. And so you had this wonderful metaphor of singers, but people, characters, within the brain, so within the pictures and the animation. So you had this sense of the soul, the mind, the brain as being one. And then, of course, through the words, um, understanding the suffering. And I suppose that's what drew me to the project so much, is Sean's approach or his lens. Although he's a scientist and a doctor, he looked at the suffering through the lens of empathy and through a very human lens. And that combination is the, the soul of the piece, the spirit. And then supported by this unbelievable music, uh, very, very complex, sad, simple, beautiful music. started the rehearsals, the whole cast got together and really discussed the subject matter and what we were trying to express. Sean spoke a lot about the phenomenon of psychotic episodes and Lara, the director, working with them on an emotional level to help them get into the minds of these characters. As the process went on, all of us learned more and more. Um, and I think the big thing that came out of it was, was the, the cultural aspect that you know there's this science or, or let's call it medicine um, and then the cultural thing that that almost needed to merge cultures are influenced by our surroundings and our communities and when something like that happens we we don't understand it and so our go-to is that oh no but that person's mad or there's something wrong and they get ostracized from the communities this show opened my mind at least to the experiences that people go through that we don't understand. And so because we don't understand it, we push it aside and we and, and, and we push those people aside. The neuroscientist presents a emphatically reductive scientific position. And interprets the experience of the patient from a strictly objective stance as a neurological dysfunction, a consequence of synaptic dysregulation. And 
in this respect, there's a conflict between the neuroscience and the doctor, who is less dispassionate, to, is seeking more to look beyond the neuroscientific explanation to the need to understand the subjective experience, what a patient is feeling. The traditional healer interprets the voices as Tebe having displeased the ancestors, the management therefore performing the appropriate rituals. We are trying to reflect the reality of our clinical practice and therefore we incorporate the position of the priest, for example, and the traditional healer. It's very important that we acknowledge those different perspectives because they shape the way people think and the way they respond and they manage the situation. Sangoma, they work totally different from the doctors because they connect with the dead. You ask to your ancestors to show you the problems of this person that is with you. And they are praying for you so that this medicine must help you. And it's up to you to believe. Your mind must tell you that whatever that I'm going to get here, I'm going to be cured. And you will be cured. In South Africa, I think it's extremely important that we differentiate cultural phenomena such as Amafufunyana and Ukutwaza, which is a calling to become a healer, simply being called and hearing voices from schizophrenia. And it shouldn't be a problem. These conditions are really quite distinct. Amafufunyana are demons that are talking to your head. They will always tell you bad things. The person who put those mafufunyan, he knew exactly what those mafufunyan must do into you. There are worse those ones who run away from Intuaso. Those ones who are supposed to be traditional healers and they run. Oh, when you see them, it's, it's sad. And if necessary, then we would bring in a healer to help us in identifying whether this is either schizophrenia or trauma. so many different ways of making sense of mental illness. For example, one interpretation is a fundamentalist, rigid, dogmatic notion that mental illness is a consequence of devil possession, when in fact they were suffering from a psychiatric illness. And I can only think that must be extremely distressing. The priest believes the symptoms are due to possession by the devil and therefore exorcism is required in order to help this young man. From the doctor's perspective, I wanted to give an account of some of the difficulties, the enormous pressures that clinicians are under in this extremely turbulent, busy admission unit. 
there are a limited number of beds, there are always people in the waiting list, there's enormous pressure to discharge patients, often when we feel they're not ready enough to be discharged. The doctor is not simply a dispassionate observer, but a participant in this uh, drug, in a sense, and describes some of his own difficulties and uncertainties. I'm fascinated by these elaborate, mystifying constructions, and I think on the part of our patients, it's some way of trying to construct a meaningful, redeeming narrative. How patients respond to treatment is sometimes very unpredictable and at times the clinicians have to live with a great deal of uncertainty as to whether one is doing the right thing. My concern is that misrepresentation significantly adds to the burden of the suffering of the mentally ill. And my fervent wish in this project is to improve the understanding of the plight of the mentally ill and in this way to hopefully diminish the problems of, of stigma and exclusion. was quite an eye-opening experience, uh, quite a profound one, and I got to work with some incredibly talented artists and um, very beautiful souls. It was a huge privilege. Oh.